energy of the ionizing form of energy, it is outweighing the risks that are associated. And if there's a possibility of using an alternative, it is always better, okay? So first, let us classify the energies that I've mentioned, and I will also include some more. So we may classify, we know radiation by definition is energy that is passing through a vacuum or through matter, dependent on its capacity to disrupt the If it has sufficient energy, we say it is ionizing radiation. Okay. If it doesn't have a capacity to disrupt uh, the arrangement of that matter or that medium, we say it is non-ionizing radiation. Okay. So for the ionizing radiation, I've listed uh, some of them. Okay, some we have already mentioned. So we have X-rays and gamma rays. Now here I refer to them as photons. So these ones are, we say, we refer to them as photons because as I said earlier on, they do not carry any charge, neither do they have any mass. Okay. And then we have those forms of ionizing radiation, okay, which are, uh, they carry a mass and a charge, so we refer to them as charged particles. So we have an electron, okay? We have protons, which are within the nucleus of the atom. And we also have alpha particles. We may also have the uh, positron, okay? Because, or beta particles, okay? So they, they also have a charge because for the beta particle, I said it has almost similar characteristics like that of an electron, but its origin is from the nucleus and it has a positive charge, but the other things are similar. The rest energy, it is the same, okay? Uh, and then we also have some form of particulate matter, but it is uncharged, okay? Uh, that is the neutron. The neutron also, it is part of the nucleus. So usually we say the nucleus, it, it consists of uh, the pro proton and the neutrons. Neutrons, they do not carry any charge. The protons, they have a positive charge. Okay. So these ones, they have a capacity to disrupt. For the X-rays and uh, gamma rays, they may not directly interact with the uh, electrons of the biological molecule or the biological matter or the human body, uh, they have to initiate, they have a, a two-step. First is to de deliver sufficient energy to the electron. This electron then generates some uh, radicals, which then will initiate changes within the uh, tissues, okay? So that's why we are saying it is ionizing radiation. Now, the other forms of non-ionizing radiation, we have ultrasound, uh, optical radiation, as well as radio waves. Okay, now this is where uh, the last bit that I said, if we consider, if we classify the types of energies that we use, we can see for ultrasound, now you're saying it is non-ionizing, which is a mechanical form of energy requiring a medium for it to move, and also the radio wave that is used together with the latent magnetism within the subject, okay? So these are the two broad categories. So then the next thing that we need to look into before delving into the of ionizing radiation. So there are two common sources of ionizing radiation. It is, uh, we can say natural sources, those ones, it is simply in the environment that we are existing. So we have the ones that are coming from outer space, the cosmic radiation. Okay. And we also have the terrestrial radiation that are coming from soil, rocks, and the soil. There's a possibility even we may get them within our foods, okay, in the 
foods that we eat, the materials that are used for building, and so forth. So these sources, we refer to them as natural background. So they exist simply in the environment that one is existing. So if we may take the case of uh, people living in high altitude, areas, we may say those ones living in high altitude areas, they are usually exposed to higher levels of radiation as opposed to those ones who are living at low altitude areas, especially the ones that are coming from cosmic radiation. Okay, the air always forms a kind of barrier. So if you are at a high altitude, we tend to uh, get exposed to, to higher levels of radiation. The other one, it could be area. There are certain areas where we have the type of rocks. They are, if they are usually resulting from uranium, they most likely tend to, we tend to have high levels of radiation, like in Kenya, in Kwale, and South Nyanza. There is are certain areas that are known to have high levels of radiation. And in other parts of the world, we have in Kerala, in India, and Guarapari, Guararapari in Brazil. The geographical location, we may find the levels of radiation that the population, human population, get exposed to is quite high. And then we have the artificial sources. Those ones are due to human activities. Okay. So if you look at uh, this pie chart, let me zoom in, you can see the contribution. This one is from uh, this publication. In 2010, the global world population that people that they get exposed to, we're seeing uh, the total amount of radiation that we get exposed to, it is around 3.0. Millisievert, it is units of radiation. Okay, so you see a large chunk of it is coming from natural background. So usually the way you said from soil, from terrestrial. So and we know uranium rocks. So you find we are getting exposed to and one of the uh, daughter products of uh, that arises from uranium. It is decay of uranium-238. It is uh, radon gas. So radon gas, it is one of the major sources of exposure of human population to background radiation among the others. Okay. Then we have a small percentage now. Uh, so we may consider uh, about 80% it is coming from natural, and then 20% it is coming from artificial or man-made sources. And if we go further, we look at uh, uh, this. So the man-made sources, let me go. The, the major source of exposure of the man-made, like we've seen in that pie chart, it is coming from medical exposure. So usage of the uh, X-rays and the gamma rays, okay, and specifically you said of the X-ray is the leading contributor of the human population to exposure to ionizing radiation. Okay, so if we look at again the same contribution, we look at the twenty percent that was from man-made sources. Now we look, we see a large percentage of the man-made sources. It is coming from. Uh, medical exposure, okay, and then we have the other contribution from the nuclear power plants as much as it is known uh, during generation of nuclear energy, we use the, the high levels of radiation, but because the, uh, it is uh, when it is working, normally there are no accidents, uh, the amount of exposure that we get, it is less, okay, we have occupational, there are certain uh, areas where we use ionizing radiation like at the airports okay we are having the checking the luggage okay so we may and also in process uh, in industrial application in processes uh, when they want to know like if the level 
like for example in the manuf manufacturing of the beverages like in coca-cola they want to know uh, if the level of the action it has reached the level they pass a gamma uh, in a ray and have a detector on the other end if they are able to detect they they are able to tell if the uh, process is up to standard or not okay and then we have the chernobyl the accidents as well as the uh, tests the nuclear tests that different countries that have been carrying out so you see it is a small proportion in comparison to the medical application okay and if we go further uh, the annual again for the global in 2008 is when i think it was you can also get the same information from the WHO uh, site. In 2008-2010, uh, 2010, the number of examinations that were done globally, okay, there were about 3.7 billion diagnostic examinations for generating of medical images, okay. See the largest chunk, hence the reason we are saying it is the X rays. Okay, and then we have nuclear medicine. Okay, usage of the radionuclides uh, 37 million examinations that were done, and then for radiotherapy for purposes of treatment, it is uh, 7.5. So you can see a large contribution which is coming from the diagnostic for the uh, imaging. Okay that contributes to the high proportion of exposure of the human population, okay? So how then do human beings get exposed? We can say there are two pathways. One, it is external and uh, internal. So in external, it means it is the case whereby the source of the ionizing radiation is outside the subject. So we say for the X-ray tube, uh, in X-ray imaging, the source is outside, okay? So and then it emits radiation that is coming towards the subject, okay? Uh, there is also, uh, if we are having in radionuclide imaging, so usually we say we use unsealed sources, so there's a possibility of one getting contamination coming into contact with it. So if one comes into contact with the uh, a radioactive material or radioisotope. If it is on their skin, then we say that is external. But if it seeps through the skin, okay, uh, it comes into them. Okay, even when it is introduced into the subject, so the patient is a source of ionizing radiation to the worker, for example, and maybe. So we say that is external, okay? When it is on the skin and then it is able to permit through, okay? So we say that is internal. So it changes from being external, it becomes to be internal. The other way of also internal, we say for the subject, we, it is the, the ingest or they are uh, injected with the radio pharmaceutical. So it becomes, it enters into their body. So it becomes to be internal. So that's how we have internal vis-a-vis -vis external. Okay. So if now we consider the biological effects, we have an entire uh, discipline that is known as radiobiology, who consists of experts who study the effects of ionizing radiation to living organisms, so including humans, and also they rely on animal experiments. So they, on the basis of animal experiments using the mice and the other mammals, as well as from epidemiological exam uh, studies, especially amongst the survivors of the atomic bomb, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as well as the early days uh, workers, okay, those who are working with ionizing radiation, the uranium miners, uh, the uh, radium, the uh, clocks that they are making with some 
paint, which they didn't know it consists of uh, thorium, or, 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 sorry, which consisted of uh, radium. And they were leaking it uh, with the, and to make the brushes to be thin in order to have a thin line on the clock, yet they were ingesting the uh, radium, which also they ended having bone tumors and other conditions. And even the early days, radio radiologists, some were doing tests on their bodies before doing the examination onto the uh, subjects because in those early days, radiation protection had not been implemented. So they also developed some uh, conditions. So there is evidence of uh, biological effects when using ionizing radiation. So these uh, effects can occur at cellular level. It can result to the killing of the cells. Okay. It can result to alteration of the information. We know our bodies, we have ability, whenever we have an injury, the body to heal or to repair itself. So if one is exposed to ionizing radiation, it can erase, particularly where so it can either erase or alter information resulting to mutations or even loss of proliferative capacities when we are having the cells that they're supposed to divide and they are not dividing or they were exposed before division, it can change their proliferative capacities. So these uh, changes, we said they can occur at cellular level. And we know when it occurs at cellular level, it It's a tissue and organ could be several number of organs resulting to the entire organism. So it can also affect the entire organism, including possible, possible death of the living organism. So there is evidence. Okay. So these uh, radiation effects, we can classify them according to the time that they occur. So we have acute and delayed. So for the time before manifestation of these effects or delayed, there is a long duration of time. There is a longer latency period before manifestation of the, of the effects after exposure to ionizing radiation. The other way to classify it is, uh, you can classify it into somatic, so the individual that have been exposed to or their offsprings. So it is somatic versus health. They're having a pregnant uh, female patient. So it may result to fetal or embryonic exposure. Okay, or effects. Okay. So, and the last one that is commonly used that I will use to classify them. It is the tissue reaction, or what was commonly referred to as deterministic effects versus stochastic. So uh, this uh, first two classification. So if we start with tissue reaction, that I've said it used also to be referred to as deterministic, they have a threshold dose below which they do not occur. So for these ones, it means if one keeps the radiation uh, dose of the radiation level to the subject to be uh, below the... Okay. The other characteristics of this effect is that it, the severity, the level of harm is dose dependent, meaning the higher the dose, the more severe, the more, uh, the higher the radiation amount that one gets exposed to, the more the severity of the effect. So I've uh, included some of this, it is a skin burn, cataract, 
and uh, radiation syndromes. They have various uh, acute radiation syndromes, gastrointestinal syndrome, and so forth. These ones, they, they have a threshold. Okay, so once one has exceeded the threshold, they will most likely occur. Now, the second category is stochastic, as the name goes. It is more of probability. Okay, so these ones, they have... Okay, however small or however high they can occur. And now, this, uh, here, the probability of occurrence depends on those, while the severity the effect of harm is independent of those. So this one includes most of the solid tumors, okay, as well as leukemia. Okay, so like I told most of the stochastic, they have uh, they, they are delayed, most of them. There's a latency period, there's a duration in between exposure and manifestation of effect for the the tissue reactions, they say they occur almost within a short time. It could be a few hours, a few days, a few minutes, even a few weeks. Okay, so these are the two broad categories radiation. So if we are to look at the implications now that we know the uh, biological effects that can arise from the usage of ionizing radiation, but we are looking at it that it also allows us to generate uh, diagnostic information or medical images. So we can say no amount of radiation exposure is completely safe, no matter how little it is. Okay. in terms of the stochastic effects that we said, they do not have a threshold dose. So even for low doses of radiation, they may induce severe health detriment, okay, such as carcinogenesis or hereditary effects or amongst the population that have been exposed to or their uh, offsprings, okay? So, there is always a need now to always unnecessary, uh, all unnecessary exposure to ionizing radiation should be avoided. So it leads us to having certain principles of radiation protection. Okay, so we first step we have to consider it is uh, justification. Is it necessary? for the patient, for the patient to be examined. If there is a possibility of getting information from uh, ultrasound, if it is available, then it is okay. But if it is only X-ray imaging modality that is available, then they, we can say it is this uh, justification because that is the only way you can extract information, okay? And now the other thing, other than uh, justification, we have uh, all unnecessary exposure to radiation, uh, all necessary exposure to radiation, ionizing radiation should be kept as slow as reasonably achievable. So here is where we are having optimization optimization in that now dependent on the case now it is required that the patient needs to undergo examination now what do we have to do in order to protect the patient while generating a diagnostic quality image because uh, you need to balance in between generating diagnostic quality providing information that is being requested for and the patient dose okay so that is where the Alara principle comes in. And there's always another uh, principle of radiation protection that is dose limitation that I haven't included here because in your case, we'll be looking at the medical application. Okay, because now for the uh, dose limitation, it is only for the 
uh, workers, uh, okay, those who get exposure, uh, exposed due to their work, or those who are working with ionizing radiation. So in your case, mostly if you'll be the ones referring, unless now you come to specialize as a radiologist or radiation oncology, that is when now the dose limitation comes in, okay? Uh, so the aim of radiation protection is to prevent the occurrence of the tissue reaction. Remember, we said for the tissue reactions, they have a threshold dose. So as long as we keep the radiation uh, levels that one is using or that the patient is getting exposed to, that the worker is getting exposed to, is always uh, lower than the threshold for the various effects the deterministic effects we want to see them okay so those ones we can prevent however for the stochastic ones we can only limit the probability of occurrence and by the so the main reason for radiation protection it is usually the limitation of the probability of the stochastic effects because we've said for the stochastic effects and there's no low dose levels, no, uh, level, no, no low levels of ionizing radiation that we can consider them to be safe. There is a possibility of them inducing. So we want to reduce the chances of them occurring by uh, exercising caution, by justifying the procedures, by optimizing the procedure for the ones that have been uh, considered to be. so in justification this is where it is always important for you to have an uh, the one that is referring the referring physician to have communication with the imaging specialist with the radiologist the one that is going to do the imaging so you discuss and find out if it is important if it is uh, uh, appropriate for one to use one imaging modality over the other, and if it is available, if it can provide the information that is being requested for. And once you've agreed it needs to be done, the examination needs to be done, taking into consideration socioeconomic factors. The other thing is to optimize the procedures. So that's where now the LARA comes in. Now the imaging specialist and the radio, radiographer and the radiological personnel will try to ensure that they uh, offer or uh, they, they uh, put measures in place to protect the patient while not compromising the quality of the image that is being generated. Okay, for the dose limitation, it doesn't apply for the clinical use, but for the workers. Okay, for the workers, those who are occupationally exposed, okay, as well as for the members of the public, there is always a dose limit that one shouldn't exceed. Okay. But now for your case, I will just dwell more on the medical exposure. Okay. So for the medical exposure of patients during diagnostic or therapeutic, so for therapeutic, I said, is where we are using ionizing radiation for treatment to kill the tumorous cells or the unwanted cells. So uh, it's based on medical decisions. So there has to be a professional judgment. So it includes exposure from artificial body implants emitting ionizing radiation that is in therapeutic where we have brachytherapy where it is a form of treatment where a source of ionizing radiation is put inside the subject okay so even when it is introduced into the subject uh, that is part of medical application and even for the radiation workers now in the case of uh, radiologists and even radiographers in uh, case of uh, especially clinical application, when radiation workers are exposed as patients, the, that component of exposure is classified as medical. So I'd say for them, there's a dose limit, so they are always monitored. So if you were, maybe the time will be rotating in a radiology department, you'll always be seeing them working with a badge, okay? and their uh, lab coats 
black one, or it could be also a different one. It is a form of detection. It allows for measurement of radiation that they get exposed in the course of them performing their duties. There is a limit, okay? Now for the medical usage or clinical use, we say there is no dose limit for the prescribed medical exposure here. The reason being, uh, we said we need to generate a diagnostic quality image. So if there's a restriction about the amount of radiation that one is to be exposed to, especially a patient, and we are having a thin patient, an obese patient, we may find for an obese patient, we may need to increase the dose, the radiation dose that one is using to allow one to generate a good quality image. So hence the reason why the medical application, it is left, uh, there's no dose limit. What is always there, we say it is guidance uh, dose levels or reference dose levels, which simply guides uh, one to tell if they are working uh, in a normal or in a conducive, using appropriate dose for purposes of generating the image. It is not a restriction like for the workers as well as for the members of the public. And also for the patients, there is no routine for the medical. You said there is no routine measurement of doses like the case that I've just mentioned about the workers where they normally they are monitored. Now for the strategies for protection of the worker, of the patients, it is clinical judgment, the way I said, necessity of the examination. Is it necessary? It then needs to be done by a, pro, um, a, a trained personnel. So should it be a quack person who knows what are the risks that are associated in the usage and what can be done to ensure at all times the benefit outweighs the risks. Okay. And then maybe the other one, it will be optimization of the protection. So this is where now mainly it's now for the radiologists, like ensuring the equipment is in good condition, uh, doing quality assurance, okay, uh, adequate preparation and instruction to the patient, uh, prepare, uh, proper performance of the examination. So if, the, if it is like the chest x-ray, tell the patient, how they, are, how they are supposed to stand, if they are supposed to place their hands away from the field and so forth. Okay. And then the other one, which is also, it can involve you, it is consider alternatives to X-rays, not only X-rays, but gamma rays, okay, where appropriate and when it is available. Okay, those are the strategies that can be used to protect the patient. And also the other thing to consider, it is the sensitive groups of patients, so for children. So you shouldn't uh, always do the, uh, like the x-rays, just unnecessarily. So this is where sometimes it is good when we have a patient coming, you could also find out if they had a previous x-ray, if it was done. And can it provide the information that is being uh, you want okay, to uh, guide you in the diagnosis? The other group, because the children, like we said, uh, especially for the stochastic, there is a longer latency uh, period. So this latency period, they, uh, the children, they have a longer uh, life expectancy as opposed to the adults. So that's why it's usually said the children are three times uh, the risk is higher in children than for the adults. And also the other sensitive population, it is the pregnant female, and in particular, it is because of the fetus. Okay, So for the unborn child, the fetus, fetus and the, the young children, as well as the pregnant female, are the uh, sensitive groups that one might need to consider if you want to do an X-ray, is it necessary or can you use an alternative? If it is a pregnant female uh, patient, is it necessary to do that examination at that time? If not, can it be postponed? Or if it is necessary to do it, then what are the 
measures that are, need, are needed to put in place in order to do the examination. So like having the shields and so forth. But there is a case where now for the specialist that is doing the imaging. Okay. So, so for ionizing radiation, that is what uh, it has about or kind of uh, things to consider. Now let's look at diagnostic ultrasound. For diagnostic ultrasound, we say we are using uh, high frequency mechanical form of energy. So the biological effects that have been suggested that they can occur, uh, it, is, uh, it is usually from animal experiments. Okay, so it is uh, only from animal ex experiments and also where they are using very high intensities of ultrasound beams. Okay, so some of the mechanism, possible mechanisms, it is elevation of tissue temperature. So we said uh, the, when we send in the ultrasound beam, it will travel into the subject. So part of it, it will be reflected. So reflection is a useful form of uh, interaction process, but we also have absorption, where part of the energy is absorbed and converted into heat. So this one, it can result to uh, elevation of tissue temperature. So that's where it can become of concern, especially uh, when we consider the fetus, there is possibility of elevation of tissue temperature. And then the other one, it is formation and uh, collapse of bubbles in uh, liquids, what is referred to as cavitation or mechanical kind of effect. So these mechanical effects, uh, it is the case where the, pres the presence of having bubbles, it can expand and collapse, uh, causing some uh, or initiating some uh, biological effects. Okay. However, I need to quickly add the diagnostic ultrasound that is used, the beams that are used, the intensities are usually well below the thresholds that have been found from the animal experiments for the tissue uh, temperature elevation, as well as for the uh, formation of the bubbles in liquids, the mechanical form. So hence the reason why we normally refer to uh, diagnostic ultrasound is considered to be a safe method of mechanical, of medical imaging with a wide uh, safety margin, okay? If you just do it correctly, there is no way you are going to encounter this. Either elevation of tissue temperature, thermal effects, or mechanical effects, formation and collapse of bubbles. Okay. Uh, for MRI, the risk of biological effects is remote. Okay, but we have some safety concerns. Okay especially when working in the environment around the powerful magnets, okay? So which can prevent, uh, present some risks to patients as well as the relatives and the personnel. So I told you the magnet, the strength, the magnetic field strength that are commonly used for MRI scanners, which is in the range of uh, one and above Tesla. So Tesla, it is a unit of magnetic field strength, while the Earth's magnetic field uh, uh, strength is about 0 0.01 millitesla. And here we are talking of uh, one Tesla. So you can see the uh, magnetic field strength that are being used in MRI scanners are quite high are quite powerful. So they have a capacity of turning objects into becoming uh, projectiles or missiles, projectile missiles. If we have, uh, for example, you're having a patient that is under oxygen support and having a cylinder, that cylinder, it is ferromagnetic. It can be attracted to the 
by the magnet, it can be turned into a missile. Okay, the other one, it is the case of having a pair of scissors. It can also be turned into a uh, missile, which can, it will be pulled towards the magnet. And if someone is standing in between, it can result to injury and even it can result to uh, death, okay? Some, it is the ability of the uh, magnetic field strength to twist, especially for patients maybe who are having a neurism clips. In some instances, there have been a report of a study where a patient was taken and they had a neurism clip and it was twisted, resulting to excessive bleeding and led to the death of the patient. Okay, So the attraction of the objects into the magnet, it poses a risk to the patient as well as to their relative, to their care, caregivers, as well as to their staff, okay? And the other one, it is the rapid evaporation of the cryogens. So I mentioned when most of when you'll be rotating in MR units, you'll uh, try to see how the temperature is, okay? It is usually cool, very cool, because of the fact that we, for us to have this high magnetic field strength, there is need of uh, keeping the conductor, the coil that is used to generate the magnetic field, to be in super uh, in a superconducting condition. Okay, very low temperatures. Okay, so they need to be kept in very low temperatures, uh, be, be about, about minus 269 or about 4 degrees Kelvin. So plus, you know, 1 Kelvin is equal to minus 273, so around minus 2 something degrees. So if there is a problem with this, so it is usually surrounded, the coil is surrounded by liquefied helium, and nitrogen, so the ones that we refer to as cryogens. So they can uh, evaporate if there's a problem with the cryostat system, okay? So always there's need of restricting access, okay, to 0 0.5 millitesla, okay? So if one is going beyond uh, this uh, zone, one needs to be checked for any methods, okay, and even to get whether there is any history and so forth, okay, if it is a patient. So there has to be also warning signs and symbols, okay, to inform one to bring to their attention that the area that they are going, they need to. So there is also always screening of patients to get whether they have any implants, okay, for the hip implants, if it is metallic, any metallic implants. Uh, uh, cardiac uh, pacemakers sometimes you need to find out and also uh, dental feelings even nowadays with the tattoos because uh, some of the tattoo uh, inks for tattoos they contain metal it can also uh, uh, be something that needs to consider it can result to some harm towards the subject okay so there is always need to have pre-examination instructions where I extract information and also uh, in case in certain instances maybe where you are having an accompanied patient where the history we do not know there could be a need of doing an x-ray to determine whether there is uh, there are any metallic objects within <laughs> rather than taking them and then finding there is a, so they had some metals okay so the design with a Faraday cage, so it is a way of confining the high magnetic field to a restricted zone and keeping away the extraneous sources of electromagnetic fields. So we say we are using the radio waves, so they fall within the range of the radio communications. Okay, sometimes, especially for the three Tesla, it could be 100 and something megahertz. Okay, which can be within the range of 
radio community. So it means if there is no way of uh, shielding uh, the interference from outside, it might affect the settings during the examination. And also the one that is coming from the MR scanner, it can also affect uh, the equipment that are outside. Usually even like the uh, image intensifier tubes for the fluoroscopic uh, unit, it can also be affected when it is placed near and when we do not have a Faraday cage, okay? So the design to facilitate escape route in case of a cryogen boil off. So there has been also accidents sometimes where uh, incidents has occurred and then the fire, uh, uh, fire, fire brigade, they come. So they always have uh, cylinders. So if again, the magnet, especially the superconducting is still on, it can also result to some uh, unexpected situation in snake. Okay, uh, it can also result to some unexpected kind of events. Okay, so they has to be designed to facilitate escape in case of the cryogen. Okay, the helium and the nitrogen when they boil off, they shouldn't just remain in the room. Otherwise, they would replace the oxygen within that room. So there is always a need to uh, having a vent to let it out. Okay. So the staff needs to be aware. So usually when you'll be rotating, you'll be told to remove anything that is ferromagnetic, keys, also times phones, ATMs, they can be affected. Okay. So it is always good practice. So I've included maybe some two images. These ones, they indicate the exposure to ionizing radiation, okay? The one on the left is the hand. It's due to a subject who held a radioactive source with bare hands. And the other one, it is a subject or a worker who decided to put a radioactive source in their pocket of their shirt, so it resulted to the burn. And lastly, it is the case where there is skin necrosis, so it is a patient undergoing uh, a cardiac catheterization procedure, so interventional procedures. For diagnostic applications, there are two kinds of uh, uh, examinations that are known to be associated, uh, possibility of observing or bumping into tissue reaction, it is interventional procedures, and two, CT, computed tomography. Okay. So I think this is my last slide on the safety concerns or as a result of the possible biological effects to the usage of the various forms of energy. In case there is a question, could pick it. Okay, there was one. Oh, oh, okay, sorry about the five minutes break. I'm seeing there was someone. Uh, this. Cook, have you the, seen the questions? I've seen this one. There's a difference between contrast agent in X rays and pharmaceuticals used. So we say for the contrast agent is simply to increase the signal, okay? So they are different. So I, uh, for the pharmaceutical that is used in, uh, uh, you will hear of uh, like, for example, for skeletal scanning, we have MDP, uh, it is methyl diphosphonate, or DTPA and so forth. So those ones, pharmaceutical agent, we say that they are only used to uh, direct the radionuclide to concentrate in the organ of interest. Okay, so here it means uh, if we were to 
put or to uh, inject technetium, which is the common type of radionuclide that is used for purposes of imprinting medical images, it may not uh, selectively concentrate. It may go in other organs. We only want because we say we are using we are using radioactive material, so we want it just to concentrate in the organ of interest and have less of it in the other tissues or other organs. That's why we have the pharmaceutical agent. And I'd say it in certain uh, applications, like uh, for the thyroid, we may use iodine because the thyroid gland has got an affinity of iodine. So if we replace the, uh, the analog iodine with a radioactive one, okay, then it will selectively concentrate. Uh, also, technetium, I think also it can, maybe if my other colleagues will tell you, it can also concentrate in uh, uh, the thyroid gland and also the brain. So it's, it could also be introduced by itself, but there's a possibility of it going into other organs. For the contrast agent, I said for uh, the ones that are used, I said uh, the, the, their work is to attenuate either to a greater extent or to a lesser degree. That's why I said when we have the barium, we we'll hear of barium enema or barium meal test. So it means, or barium swallow. So it means the patient is given a high Z material, barium. It has a higher Z. So it will attenuate to a greater extent. So it means for the vessel or like for the intestines containing them, they will uh, have a different uh, appearance as opposed to the surrounding structures, which helps one to delineate, okay? And then, is it true that tattoo ink <coughs> is... Uh, the, <coughs> I think I mentioned <coughs> about the tattoos. I've said some, <coughs> if it has some uh, metallic component, there is a, a, a possibility, hence the reason why if one has got tattoos and they have to undergo MRI, there could be a need of covering <clears throat> that part where the tattoos are. Okay, I don't know if there's, there's another one. Okay, for the pacemakers, okay, the other, now the other thing is to consider is uh, uh, for the pacemakers, sometimes uh, nowadays people are using the different types of materials instead of having iron and maybe stainless steel and other materials which can be attracted, we are having like titanium, which is uh, non-ferromagnetic, it can be attracted. So that's where now it can be used for the safety of the pacemakers. So it is always important, it can be altered because we say when we apply the RF uh, field, we, there are several things also which I haven't mentioned in MRI. Uh, we also have to determine from which part that one is imaging. We want to get the signal from that region. So they always have some gradient fields. So there is always, even when you go there, you hear of the loud noise that is there. It is due to the switching on and off of the gradient field. So it might affect the pacemakers. So, but sometimes if one has to undergo, there could be a need of having an agent or a, surgeon, a person who placed it to be around just in case an incident occurs. Okay. So uh, then, the, so do you avoid it? Right? No, okay. I've said this one. I've said there is a bit of if they have to, there could be a need of having either uh, personnel from the company that manufactures or supplies that pacemaker or uh, the staff who had put it into the subject just in case something happens. And then our metal detectors part of, no, metal detectors are not ionizing radiation. And then uh, is it all forms of intervention or radiology that can cause skin necrosis? Yes, for the reason why we are saying interventional radiology or where, okay, in fluoroscopy, it is the case whereby they are using, uh, we said in fluoroscopy, we are generating 
live images. So it means the source is always on. So like when, when putting like the catheter, if one is going to do it over a long time, then there is a high chance of reaching the threshold dose. So that's why most of the things like now we advise the ones who are doing the personnel or the specialists who are doing the imaging nowadays, instead of uh, having uh, to step on the pedal, so to turn the tube on while they are looking at the screen, there is uh, the ability of uh, the machine displaying the last image that was captured and then one can look at it while they have stepped off the pedal while not producing x-rays as much as they want. And then when they are comfortable, they step and then to minimize. So what we refer to as past fluoroscopy, sending short pulses, not always leaving the tube to be on. And then for the CT, so if one does the examination without elongating over a long time, over one area, it is not always the case that you'll see them, but there is a possibility of bumping into them. That's why I showed you the image. Okay. So, and always, again, there is the balance between one needs to balance. So if it is the only one that is available and that is the only way you're going to get the information, then say it is justified. Okay. Because there is, it is more also a risk for you, more bad for you to miss out or to lose out, maybe you are reducing like the dose to the subject and generating a poor quality, which will force one to repeat the examination, which will result to unnecessary exposure. Okay. And then share, I will share the notes to the classroom. So, and then the last one is when it comes to breast imaging, what addition cannot be deduced from a breast ultrasound. Now, okay, I think, Akini, can I refer you to some of my colleagues? I think they will be covering with you, the radiologist. They will take you through. Okay, what can be, they will be the ones who will tell you when to use ultrasound and when to use MRI or when to use even radionuclide imaging for purposes of detecting the breast, 